So the story of the three wise men, the, the reality of the three wise men, uh, is something very important, which the opening prayer of our Mass said today, where, Lord, you have shown your salvation to the nations, okay? So before this event, the, the chosen people were, were the Jews, and then the shepherds who came were more than likely Jews. Uh, and they, they, lived a, they, in a, in, they lived in a fairly close-knit kind of community and kind of close-knit reality. God didn't actually like them mixing with foreign nations very often because invariably when they did, they would adopt the practices uh, of the other nations and also the other gods, the other deities, the other ways of sacrificing uh, to, to other gods. So basically they, they couldn't really be trusted to, to mingle very much. That's why in a lot of the Old Testament readings we see how God forbids them from doing things that other nations do. Uh, not so much that the, the, the eating of crayfish or the wearing of clothes made of mixed fiber like other nations did. And it's not that these things are sinful in and of themselves, but when they would do these things, they would start to adopt the other practices of these people as well and uh, lead them away from the truth. Okay, so uh, when this event of the Epiphany occurs, three men who were from the Orient, from the East, we don't know exactly from where, probably modern-day Iraq, Mesopotamia, uh, Mesopotamia, however you pronounce it in English, uh, and they more than likely, um, uh, yeah, they, they, they came then to, to the, the script scene and they weren't Jews, they more than likely were not Jews. So then the, the, the revelation, the joy, the uh, event of, of Christ's birth is now made visible to non-Jews, right, to people outside of this Jewish community. And they would have brought this message home with them to wherever they came from. But there's so many little details here that, that, that are quite, quite fascinating and, and important for us to pick up on. Obviously, the three wise men, they see, we don't know exactly what they saw. We see a star, but we're not quite sure how, how it worked. Some astronomers think it's actually possible that Saturn and Jupiter would have aligned uh, to, to make it look like a kind of a superstar. Superstar, look at that. Uh, an exceptionally bright star. Uh, so that would have been an event that wouldn't have occurred very often. Otherwise, if, if, if these were regular events, um, it's very unlikely that the wise men would have up and left for months to travel. Uh, so if, if this were like an event that occurred every couple of years, uh, it wouldn't have been particularly noteworthy. Whereas the alignment of Jupiter and Saturn happens about every 400-ish years. So it's, it's, it's quite rare. So that's, that's, it's possible then that, uh, which actually uh, did occur around, around that time. Uh, it's quite possible that this alignment of the stars uh, could have led them. Now obviously, they're looking for a king. So where do they go? Well, they go to the palace you know, to congratulate the king on probably his son's birth or something like that. Is that what happened? No. Uh, and King Herod says, well, what, what king are you talking about exactly? The only king around here is me. Elvis hadn't been born at that point. So, um, uh, so the only thing around here is me. And they say, well, he, he inquires with the uh, local priests where the, the uh, savior, the Christ, is due to be born. They say, Bethlehem. Okay, so then Herod, in his devious cunning plan, tells the kings to inform him on his way back that he too may do him homage. It's a, like, such a, a, a devious thought, you know, that I too may do him homage, when like right from the beginning, his thought is that I too, that I may kill him. This is his plan. That I may do him homage, though, is what he says. So when the kings arrive, and the gifts they have, they brought gifts for a king. Do you know, I mean, uh, you might have seen some of the memes going on around, around Christmas where, you know, if the three wise men had been three wise women, they'd have brought blankets, nappies, and maybe a bottle or two, you know. Instead, what, they bring gold, frankincense, and myrrh, completely useless gifts for a child, you know. Uh, but the gifts themselves are very symbolic. The gifts themselves have, have profound meaning, uh, considering Jesus' vocation. Gold, because he's a king. So it's one of the most precious metals that we have. So you, gold, because it's, I mean, uh, it's a gift worthy of a king, okay? Frankincense, now frankincense, that's an incense in general. Incense was generally, uh, even to this day, we associate it with it being burned at adoration, benediction, those kind of things. And back in the day as well, it would have been fairly much, pretty much reserved for kings, sorry, for, for gods, for, for the worship of, of gods. So here we have a king, and there's this kind of divine aspect to him as well. 
right? gold and incense. Now, the, the oddest gift, probably, is, is the myrrh. Now, myrrh was used for preparing bodies after they had died, right? So it was, it was a kind of a, a spice that would mask the odor. Sorry to be blunt about it, but there you go. So uh, it's, you're giving a gift to someone, so on their birthday, it's, it's like giving someone a voucher for a coffin on their birthday. You know, like you're, you're saying that death's going to come, and this will prepare you, for, this is part of the preparation for, for your embalming, you know. It's, it's quite an, a, 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 a strange gift, really. And yet, do you know, when we, when we see this, obviously we see it after 2,000 years of Christian tradition, or more, more importantly, we see it uh, in, in the light of the passion, right? Where you have a king who is God, who is sacrificed. Right, you know, Jesus, so this, Jesus became man so that he can die on a cross. Jesus, God, becomes man so that he can die on a cross. Jesus becomes man so that he can prove his great love for us. Jesus becomes man so that in dying on the cross, he can open the gates of heaven for us. So all this is kind of, it's all tied in together. This Jesus being king and being God and being sacrificed. So did the kings know that their gifts meant all of this? Probably not. Did, so they, they didn't know who they were going to. They didn't know what he was going to look like or where he was going to be. But what I love about this story, is this one little detail we mentioned earlier. King Herod wants to, says that he wants to go do him homage when he actually wants to, to kill him, to kill the child Jesus. So when they leave King Herod, they see the star, the star fills him with the light, they go into the house, they see the child and his mother Mary, and falling to their knees, they did him homage. Falling to their knees. Now imagine... These guys are pretty smart, probably pretty rich that they'd be able to afford such gifts and afford to leave their homes with a caravan of, of travelers and servants. I mean, this, this wasn't for the, for the regular Joe Soap. Uh, they were, so they're more than likely quite wealthy. Now, they arrive at a stable, a shed. Like, you, you, you could imagine they're dismounting from their camels or horses and looking around going, this, this can't be right. But we look, I suppose, we've come this far, like so, you know. So they knock on the stable door and <laughs> find a couple inside there, and animals, and a baby. And the star, it's about right. I guess this is it. I mean, you just imagine, like, just, you know, we, we, when we read the story, it just seems so easy. The king king's arrived at the stable and walked in. I mean, they're, like, they're, they're looking for a king here. You know, if you arrived here, you know, you come to the front door, you don't go around to the garage, right, and, and, and look for the owner of the house. You know, they arrive at a, at a shed, and they see a child in a trough. Like, it's all wrong. <laughs> the whole picture is all wrong. But they drop to their knees and pay him homage. I love that. Like, they, they smart, intelligent, rich, capable men but they see that there's something special here and they drop to their knees and do him homage. And I, I just, that's just so important to, to never lose sight of that. Also for us adults, as I keep saying in, in this Christmas season, Christmas isn't just about children and getting gifts and Santee and all that kind of stuff. Um, I haven't much time for that, if I'm honest. Um, no, I have time for children, just not much time for the whole commercial Coca-Cola Santa Claus thing. Um, but I think it's really important for us to see Christmas also from the perspective of adults, right? These grown, intelligent men drop to their knees in front of Jesus and do him homage because they believe that there is something very, very special about this child. They believe he is the king of the Jews and maybe even more than that. So it's like there's something very, very beautifully simple and yet so intensely eloquent about this, this manger scene. It's, you know, on one hand, it's all wrong. <laughs> it shouldn't be this way. And yet, there's a kind of a, 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 an eloquence about the, the humility, the, 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 the simplicity of the Holy Family, and yet, the greatness in their humility. God's plan being worked out in the small things. And we think of how recently, <clears throat> in Ireland, uh, there was that New Year's Eve show 
on uh, on RTE or for those who aren't Irish, um, our national television, one of our national television stations, uh, showed a, a scene of it was supposed to be a comedy sketch of uh, a news reporter <laughs> declaring how God had been found guilty. God the Father had been found guilty, and he was being imprisoned for raping a young migrant girl who had then become pregnant. And he's been dragged away by a policeman sh shouting. It was 2,000 years ago. Like, we think of the reverence, the, the homage, the adoration that is due to Jesus, that is due to God. And this is just, I mean, that, that was supposed to be funny. That was supposed to be humorous. You could just imagine doing that to any other member. Imagine, imagine making fun of Muhammad. Imagine making fun of the traveler community or the LGBTQ community. Imagine doing anything like that on New Year's night. There would be absolute uproar. But you feel that it's okay to make fun of God. Just when I, when I the following day, I didn't see, see the show, but the following day I heard about it. And this one line <coughs> from St. Paul's letter to the Galatians just came to mind. Uh, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For you reap what you sow. It's such a simple little line. But there's like a gentle threat in it. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. You reap what you sow. You want to make fun of God? Work away. But God isn't a wimp. And while, yes, he's loving, and yes, he's merciful, there are consequences to treating God like a, a joke. There are consequences. If you don't want God's blessing, you don't have to have it. And as a nation, if we don't want God's blessing, we don't have to have it. God's blessing isn't automatic. If I don't want God in my life, he still loves me. But if I don't want his grace, I don't have to have it. If I don't want his blessing, if I don't want God's protection, I don't have to have it. But let us not be naive or let us not be deceived. There are other spiritual influences out there that do not want my good. So if I don't want God's protection, if I don't want God's blessing, I don't have to have it. But best of luck taking on all of hell on your own, my friend. You don't stand a chance without God. We think it's okay to make fun of God. We will see the consequences of that. Even three foreigners knew how to kneel down in front of God and knew how to recognize him as Savior, recognize him as the Messiah. And we who've had the, the grace of 2,000 years of Christian tradition, we can't do that. The consequences are ours. We ask the good Lord today that we can follow the example of our three wise men and recognize God for who he is and recognize the adoration that he deserves, the reverence that is due to his name, the reverence that is due to his house, the reverence that is due to his church. We pray that we may rediscover that God isn't any ordinary divine thing, but that he is our creator. He deserves our love. He deserves our everything. Amen.